Thank you very much. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, I would ask you to buckle your seat belts. I'm going to give you a 100,000 foot view of uh, what we're doing at FedEx Express uh, in the form of uh, electric and, and alternate fuel vehicles. First, I have to give you the commercial, uh, who FedEx is uh, and what we, what we are and what we're doing. Uh, I think the key thing that on this slide that, is, that you need to see is the fact that we're located in over 220 countries around the world. We have 290,000 people uh, working for us and we have over 90,000 uh, motorized vehicles. So we have a, quite a test bed of vehicles that we can experiment with, that we can utilize as we try to develop and see what's out there in the alternative uh, fuel and uh, energy uh, business. One of the questions that I get asked a lot is, can FedEx make money with an EV strategy? And I'll attempt to answer that with just a few slides here quickly and uh, show you where we are. First off, we take a, uh, a dual view of what we're trying to accomplish. Obviously, we have a business to run. When you talk about sustainability, I can tell you that there is no sustainability if there's no economic sustainability. So first off, we have to run our existing business. So on the left side of the uh, slide you see there is what we currently try to do. We are, we're looking for the most fuel efficient vehicles that are uh, with the internal combustion engines or whatever we're gonna be operating. And we're always looking for ways to optimize our route structure so that we run the fewest miles possible and always looking to improve the design and performance of our vehicles, regardless of how they're powered. Then on the other side of that, we're looking to be a part of what's happening in the future. Uh, we are always, we say they're the leading edge of product design. We are actually, I would tell you, on the bleeding edge very often of product design. We're always looking for what's new. We will just about test anything. I get in trouble when I say that because you won't believe what comes out of the woodwork. But, so I have to be a little careful, but we will test a lot of things that sound a little far-fetched, but you never know what kind of things you're gonna find when you do that. So uh, we are always interested in the infrastructure requirements. It's so good to hear what was said here by the two speakers before me, because as we look to expand our uh, EV footprint, that's one of the issues that has to be taken into consideration. So it's a, it's a, it's a major event for us. Uh, what do we do? Well, we sell certainty. And the reason I want to bring that up is that whatever vehicles that we are utilizing in our daily routine to provide the service we provide to our customers, they have to be reliable. We cannot afford to sacrifice what we sell, which is certainty to our customer, be because a vehicle doesn't deliver what it's supposed to deliver. So of everything that we look at, that has to be foremost in our minds. When we talk about cost effectiveness, we started looking at how could we impact the industry and help the industry develop uh, cost, effective me uh, cost effective methods. One of the things we found right out of the bat, when we started buying pure EVs uh, three years ago with lithium ion batteries in them, there was one size, one size battery. And it was not about a size battery we needed. We were paying about $1,000 per kilowatt hour for the battery, and the only one we could buy was an 80 kilowatt battery. So that battery was costing us $80,000. You can imagine what the, what the vehicle total cost was. So we've, we found right away by starting to work with the battery manufacturers to deal with the, having the right size for the route that we were going to run, that would, would reduce the cost a great deal. Uh, then it, the battery cost itself, working with the manufacturers to help them find ways to reduce the cost of the batteries. And then to look to ways that we could help the manufacturers get to uh, some scale because today, most of the vehicles that we buy, the commercial vehicles, are not built on an assembly line. They're built in a job shop, and that's extremely expensive. So there are all types of things that we could do that we shared with the various manufacturers, try to help them become more economically uh, efficient in what they were trying to do. We actually started in 1992 with our first electric vehicles. And uh, we were part of a, a study that was done out in California. Uh, it was called Clean Fleet. It was part of the Department of Energy. And uh, we had CNG, LPG, and EV vans. Now, those vans had a range of about 15 miles. So you can imagine how limited they were. And obviously, the end result of that was, eh, we're not quite ready for prime time yet. 
But as you can look at and see through the years, we've continued to develop and look for ways to utilize new technologies up to the point today where we are uh, really exploring everything that's out there in terms of alternative fuels and alternative energy. We have uh, deployed these vehicles around the world. Uh, that it's maybe hard to see those, uh, those locations, but this slide really is just to indicate we have them in China, we have them in uh, Europe, we have them uh, all in different parts of Asia, we have them all over the United States. Uh, we're looking to deploy them now into South America, Mexico, and Canada, and we'll do so probably next year. Part of that is to get a, an international flavor for the utilization of these vehicles. Uh, we're also looking at retrofitting existing vehicles. I have three different companies involved today in our retrofit program. I actually have two that are already retrofitted where we take out the internal combustion drivetrain and install an electric drivetrain into the vehicle. So we've already offset the cost of that piece of the uh, initial cost of the vehicle. And now all we have to do is pay for the uh, electric drivetrain. So we think that may have some potential for us in the future, again, as we try to make this economically sustainable. Now, this is a slide probably that tells the whole story because with our years of experience, what we've developed here is an actual cost of break-even level with the cost of diesel fuel. So if you look, for instance, at uh, where we're headed, I think, right now at $4.75 on the left-hand side, with a hybrid, we could pay a premium of 23.9% and still break even. But if you come on across to an EV, we could pay an 87.8% premium with no battery replacement or a 72.9% premium if we had to replace the battery after seven years. Obviously, uh, with the newest batteries that we have now, the three years is the longest we have out there. We are projecting an eight to 10 year life, but obviously projections don't always come true. But we really think that we're gonna be somewhere in that area. So we aren't that far away. Today, the price uh, premium on an electric vehicle has dropped greatly from where we started buying them three years ago. It is about 50% of what we were paying three years ago. So we are almost at that 100% premium price today. So at 575, we could pretty much break even with, uh, with diesel fuel at $5.75 in terms of the savings we would realize through operating cost and maintenance costs with an EV as compared to a internal combustion engine. One of the things we're doing is working with colleges, uh, with uh, uh, different uh, manufacturers and, and providers across the world to try to determine more about what the gentlemen just before me were talking about and how to, uh, what kind of impact will these EVs have on the, uh, on the grid and things like that. One of the uh, programs I have in front of you right now is a program we're doing in New York City in conjunction with Columbia University, with Con Edison, and with General Electric. Uh, we're taking these vehicles and we're utilizing them with the help of the <clears throat> supercomputer at Columbia University so that we'll know the, the value of things like uh, using the vehicle for storage and things of that ma matter. Some of the uh, benefits to society, of course, of electric vehicles, uh, reduced noise and pollution. As a matter of fact, we have been approached by some groups saying that we need to put some noise makers on these EVs, that they're too quiet. <clears throat> so uh, we're looking at that. I don't know where that's going to go. Uh, increased grid stability, as was, was mentioned earlier, uh, reduced peak electricity demand. Most of the charging that we do is at night, at the off-peak hour, so it does work out rather well. Uh, and then all of the other things that have been mentioned earlier, I won't dwell on those. <clears throat> there are other opportunities through this program to develop and to enhance not only the vehicles themselves, but the infrastructure. And again, that's been talked about enough tonight, so I won't dwell on that, but there's a lot of work going on across the country and across the world in these areas. We're uh, entering into a uh, study now with a group in Germany. We hope that will come to fruition, and we think we'll see some things studied along these same lines there in greater detail. Uh, and then what these technologies are going to be, that are going to be studied are is the machine learning, on-site energy systems, integrated systems, and control. You say, well, what's this all about? What's, it so, what's so critical about it? Well, I've, this little slide here is sort of a, it's hard to see, I know, but the indication is, is how much energy is used by one of these commercial vehicles. Ten of the vehicles that I have in New York City will 
equal our peak energy usage at the peak time, just 10 vehicles. As a matter of fact, one of these vehicles equals about the, the energy usage of a home. So if I put one of my stations with 100 vehicles, if I converted all of those to electric vehicles, you'd see I'd have a small subdivision in terms of energy usage. This is very important to people like Duke Power, having to provide that energy. It really changes the, the, the game and it really changes how we have to look at the infrastructure question when it comes to these types of things. What are the technological challenges? Of course, uh, battery cost and life. The life cycle, we really still don't know. We have a lot of good promises and projections out there. It looks like they're going to live at least eight years, maybe 10, but we really don't know. So there's a lot to learn there. In terms of the cost, it, just last week, there was announcements that new energy density studies have been done with certain companies, and we're hearing promises of 300 mile ranges and uh, cost as low as $125 a kilowatt hour. That's a game changer. If we can realize that, that's a game changer. Because even with the cost per mile differential that you saw on an earlier slide, being so much cheaper with an electric vehicle than an internal combustion engine, you've gotta be able to run the miles to realize that savings. For instance, if I put an electric vehicle out and I only run it 15 or 20 miles today, then it takes a long time to recoup the premium price on that vehicle. But if I can run that vehicle for 200 miles, then the cost per mile really makes a difference. So that's exciting stuff. I think it's just around the corner. I believe in the next three to five years, you'll see vehicles with certainly over 200 miles and maybe as much as 300 miles in range. And with the cost coming down, then it becomes a no brainer. This is a, uh, a real player in the uh, transportation segment. If somebody asked me the other day, have you guys picked a winner yet? I don't believe it's gonna be that simple. Personally, what I think is going to happen is you're going to see a combination. We see this in our fleet today. We have a number of needs in our duty cycles. And so I think you're going to see a combination for years to come, probably of some sort of internal combustion engine. But you're going to see things like plug-in hybrids. You're going to see things like uh, just pure EVs, uh, other types of things that will be out there. Obviously, uh, natural gas has some part to play in all of this. So I don't believe there's going to be a winner. I think it's going to be a combination of things. And we certainly see that, again, in our duty cycle. There are things that early on, when we started in this, really weren't a consideration. For instance, like creature comforts. The first electric vehicles we ran had no air conditioning and very little heat. They had heaters, but they didn't heat. So, and drivers can get real cranky when they get hot or cold. So obviously that's gotta be considered. And so that's part of the issue of being able to provide those creature comforts. A lot has been done in the last three years. And the vehicles we're putting out today are equipped with very effective air conditioners and with very effective heaters. And it doesn't deteriorate the range that much. It does have an impact, but it's not as detrimental as it was three years ago. And this thing about range anxiety, again, going back to my premise earlier, we sell certainty. So I can't afford to get up against a range buffer. So we have to always have a big cushion in there. So if the range is say 80 miles or 100 miles, obviously I'm probably not gonna run that vehicle on a route that's gonna be over 50 or 60 miles. So that range anxiety does limit the benefits you can get from an electric vehicle. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier about the mass production challenges with our, in our world in the commercial vehicle space today, those vehicles are built by hand in job shops. It's very expensive. We've got to find ways to introduce uh, mass production techniques and efficiencies into these to, wrote, to take that cost down. Um, what does it mean to the FedEx customer? Well, I, believe it or not, we have a lot of customers who want to do business with us because we are envir environmentally conscious. We do try to keep technology uh, right on the bleeding edge. And customers can benefit from that. There's a lot of things that they can do, not only by doing business with us, but by identifying with us in some of these areas. It certainly enhances uh, their image in the world in what they're trying to do with social responsibility. I did, I'm gonna close out now with some pictures. I like pictures. I love to see pictures. Some of these vehicles are, are, are really foreign looking. Uh, some of the manufacturers think they have to make them look a little weird 
Frankly, uh, it doesn't matter to us. It doesn't have any impact on the usability. If you've seen our, we call our cartoon commercial, the one where the little truck's floating in the trees and right, driving around with all the little elves and everything. Uh, that's the truck up in the uh, right-hand corner. And of course, it looks like an electric vehicle, doesn't it? But the truth of the matter is, we really don't care. These are uh, four that we're using uh, that uh, are pretty prevalent in our fleet. Uh, here's some, some that are really evolving now. Uh, we just started using the Nissan uh, NV200 uh, just this last month in Europe. And it has a lot of promise. And it's, what's really encouraging about that vehicle is it's built on the same uh, frame as the Leaf. And so it has some common characteristics with the Leaf. So there we are generating scale again. Uh, the Smith Electric, we helped develop that and design that vehicle. We have the only prototype in the world running right now. And it looks like it may be really uh, promising because they have lowered the cost and really have it to where it's, it's viable in terms of, of that uh, element. And then the Boulder Electric, uh, they're brand new on the scene. Uh, they're located in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, so their vehicle looks a little scary, but uh, we're excited about this vehicle because it seems to have some ex uh, extended range to it. And there's some really neat ideas with, with that vehicle. Four years ago, when we started in this, in this business, there were two manufacturers primarily. As you can see now, there are a whole list of people who are in the business, who are working with us, and there are even others that aren't named up here that I'm still under a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't really cover that right now. Regula regulations and policies that would support our strategy. Obviously, we need uh, uh, good fuel economy regulations with the vehicles that we're still running. We want to have the most uh, efficient vehicle possible out there. The less fuel we burn, the smaller our carbon footprint. Now, yes, it does save us money, but that's just a minor concern. We don't really think about that that much. Um, with electric drive trains for some years to come, we're going to need incentives. With what's going on in Washington now, you know, it's, it's really in vogue to be against things. And so we have people who are against electric vehicles because they don't, don't understand them. We have people who are against this or against that. But we really, I think, for some time, we need some incentives to help with, get people accustomed to the fact that there's a lot of benefit. And if you haven't driven an electric vehicle, let me tell you, do it. Uh, I was on the GM's test track with a, uh, one of their vehicles, uh, oh, it's been about three months ago, doing about 140 miles an hour. And it had a lot left in it. I didn't. I was, I was done at 140, but it would, it would have done more. And so, I mean, these things drive great. They're, they're good vehicles. Our drivers love them. We do not have to ask anyone to drive these when, well, that we did with the ones that didn't have air conditioning. Okay, tell the truth. But the ones that we're putting out there now, they love them. There's absolutely no problem at all. They really want to be part of it. And then we still, uh, of course, want to explore what's going to happen with the natural gas world. And the key there is, of course, infrastructure availability. And we do have another issue. We park most of our vehicles inside, so there is an issue there with uh, ventilation and so forth that's very expensive to convert a building so it meets the, the regulations. So we see, and as I close, a lot of potential, especially in the EV world, and we plan to be part of it. Thank you very much.